My name is Valera. Uh, I have Kevin here with me that I dragged uh, for his first ever uh, public talk, maybe. I don't know, maybe not public talk, but first ever DroidCon. It's also a first ever DroidCon for me. Uh, and today we're going to talk about my p favorite topic, uh, which is UI testing. So really excited. I had to go back. Uh, by the way, we have engineering slides. We don't have pretty animations and stuff like that. Uh, I had to go back and count. Uh, how many times I've talked about UI testing in public. Uh, and I think this is my sixth presentation on UI testing. Uh, I've given also a lot more internal talks at, at Google and Slack. Uh, why do I keep coming back to this topic? Uh, well, I think UI testing is kind of an evolving story. Um, and uh, every time there's something new and exciting that happens, uh, I'm, I just look forward to sharing it. And uh, hopefully, you know, also, it will be useful to you. Um, the other reason is, is this. Uh, I really like surveys. Uh, people who work with me know that I send out like, way too many surveys at work. Uh, and I like to ask people's opinion about you know, stuff. Uh, and last year, actually, in August 2016, I conducted a survey, uh, sent it out on like, Twitter and uh, Android study group of people, um, whether they do UI testing while they do UI development in conjunction with, with their UI screens. Uh, and as you can see, while many, many, many people do uh, unit testing, not everybody, uh, actually only about 70% uh, of people added a UI test. And I think this number, you know, there's a self-selection bias, so I think this number would actually be lower in reality if we pulled every single Android developer out there. Uh, so, and I thought, okay, well, how about this year? You know, how, are, how are things looking this year? Well, unit testing improved. Uh, everybody does unit testing these days, apparently. By the way, uh, raise your hand if, you know, if, uh, if you've developed Android UI in like the last three months or so. Cool. Uh, and what about uh, unit testing? How, did you add unit tests for, for your functionality? Keep your hands up. So like about 70% of the room. Uh, and then raise your hands if you wrote a UI test. Cool. So yeah, about like 50% of the room. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, you can see here that not everybody does, uh, does UI testing. And as long as that's the case, as long as it's still hard and it's still kind of a problem that, that people consider to be kind of insurmountable, um, I'm going to keep coming back and presenting on it. So I might be doing this for a while. We'll see. Then I kind of asked why people don't do UI testing. Um, this year. Uh, the number one reason is no time. Um, I don't know. There, I, I like this quote about meditation that uh, you know, if, uh, if you don't have time for, so you, know, you should meditate for about like five minutes a day. But if you don't have time for meditation, you should meditate for 20 minutes a day. Uh, I think it's kind of similar you know, in the testing world. Like if you're, if you're using time as an excuse to not write tests, you're essentially like kind of deferring the problem uh, to, to later time. But I think no time is essentially equivalent to it's too hard. It just takes too long. Um, and uh, also just maybe not trusting in the results of what you're producing. So that's why I keep coming back to this topic and, uh, and you know, trying to just kind of push uh, our community forward in, in this particular space. Um, and I decided, OK, bad timing. Uh, this was actually you know, the keynote that we listened to today uh, was, was absolutely wonderful setup for for our talk, uh, because I also decided that I've been doing this for a while, um, that I'm going to go back in time and just kind of uh, do a review from, of my testing story, of my UI testing story. Um, and it's also the same disclaimer as Chet and Romain um, had. Uh, there are a lot more people that talk about UI testing, so Chuki, Sam, um, Michael Bailey. Uh, so you know, this, is, this is kind of like my perspective on UI testing. It's not by any means a complete picture. Uh, but I have been at it for a while, so uh, I'll take you back to 2011 uh, when I joined Google to work on this exciting project called Google Wallet. Anybody remember Google Wallet? Anybody use Google Wallet? Anybody successfully use Google Wallet? <laughs> uh, anyway, actually, I use Android Pay, you know, so it's a, obviously a predecessor to Android Pay. Uh, and I use Android Pay uh, quite a lot these days. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, the two stores that I shop at both take Android Pay. It's awesome. But 2011 was, uh, was a different time and place than where we are today. Uh, 
Chad and Romain kind of uh, already went over that, you know, those slides. Does anybody remember, this was the state of the art, you know, version of Android. Anybody want to guess which one that is? I think they kind of gave it away. Anybody? Which, which version of Android is this? Yes. And, you know, they talked about the Nexus S phone. So, so that's when I got into Android development. Um, and actually, that was, you know, that was a good time, I think. This is what we developed on. Anybody miss Eclipse? <laughs> yeah? All right. Kevin also. I told you, I'm not the only one. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody miss the ARM emulator that doesn't boot up? No? All right, all right. So much, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that, you know, that was a challenge. And UI testing uh, in 2011 looked kind of like this. So I know some of you have seen this photo already, but I'm going to keep showing it as long as people keep laughing. So maybe not everyone has seen it. Uh, but this is actually something that I built uh, for the purpose of running UI tests, because running the tests on the emulator at that point in time was completely not workable. Um, whoops. And it was actually working pretty well. Um, this was phones uh, on a whiteboard so that I could see the screens. I love watching UI tests run. It's like, it's just uh, one of those things that's, um, you know, it's kind of therapeutic to me <laughs> when they succeed. Um, and everything was working fine. Uh, the CI system was working great uh, until um, all of a sudden everything went red. And I go into the room where these phones were, um, were located and I see all of them splattered on the floor. Uh, and it turns out the Velcro melted because the phones heated up so much. So I had to rework some of this harness. Uh, that was on the CI side of things. I'm just telling this because it's a funny story. It has nothing to like, do with writing UI tests. But this did have to do with writing UI tests. This was the state-of-the-art uh, UI testing framework at the time. Does anybody remember Robotium? How many of you still use Robotium today? Cool. You, you do? <laughs> OK. Um, and um, Robotium was, was good for, for its time. Uh, it solved one particular problem, which was it was difficult to write UI tests uh, just using straight-up instrumentation. Uh, notice, by the way, Chad and Romain did not talk about testing APIs today. So that just kind of gives you, uh, you know, an idea of how much I think the Android team has, they've come a long way as far as testing support is concerned. Uh, but Robotium had one kind of small problem, and that is that if you wrote a bunch of Robotium tests uh, and you were to run them in CI, uh, you were more, most likely to get this picture. Um, and the problem is that Robotium just completely didn't take care of multi-threading and synchronizing your UI tests with a UI test thread where all of your UI gets processed. Actually, not all of your UI, but a lot of it. So uh, we were working on you know, Robotium and uh, trying to kind of make the best of it uh, on Google Wallet. Uh, and finally, we kind of said, well, it's just it's not working out for us, so let's start from scratch. Uh, fast forward to 2013, uh, we introduced uh, in April of 2013 at a conference, the Google Test Automation Conference in New York, um, my team introduced Espresso. We didn't have that pretty logo at that time, by the way. It was just, you know, I just used an image of an espresso cup. And by the name Espresso. Espresso, ah, uh, the name. So this so, is when Valero was at Google working on the testing framework? So naming is really hard, obviously. Everybody knows that meme, that naming is one of the hardest problems. I actually agree with that. Uh, we had like, we had a, you know, um, a whiskey-fueled kind of brainstorming session, um, and we did not come up with a name. The code name for Espresso was Honey Badger, actually. Um, I, yeah, I keep reusing that code name just because Honey Badger is so cool. Uh, but it wasn't very marketable. So yeah, we were just standing like the next day after the whiskey-fueled session. We were just standing uh, at the Espresso bar uh, in the Google San Francisco office, and it just sort of you know, came to us that, hey, espresso, it's fast, uh, it's coffee, it's, you know, Java related. Uh, and by the way, we didn't ask marketing um, whether it's okay to use this name. They later, when I had to like open source espresso, I had to ask marketing for permission. And they said, well, we wouldn't have allowed you to use this name because it's like too close to Java and we would get sued. But since you're already using it and everybody knows it as espresso, okay, you can keep it. <laughs> so. Moral of the story, uh, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Well, OK, anyway, <laughs> not always. That doesn't work for everything, but uh, for, for naming, sometimes it works. 
Um, and Espresso uh, introduced this new API. Um, you know, they talked about the fact that APIs are like your future regret. I actually kind of like this API still to this date. Of course, I'm biased. Um, it it def definitely has its issues, and you know, there's there's stuff that could be improved. Uh, but the the one thing that Espresso did do is it helped you synchronize your sort of. It took away the multi-threading worries somewhat out of the picture. You, you know, you still sometimes have to worry about multi-threading and idling resources and whatnot. Um, and you know, at that point, we're like, well, we're done here, right? We we have this awesome new framework we can run, you know, write UI tests in, and everything is just going to be great, and we can just start working on other things finally. Uh, but no, Espresso was kind of incomplete. Um, we um, originally, when we released Espresso, we we just had to plop it down on code.google.com. It was actually not part of the Android open source project, not part of uh, any support libraries. Um, and so there was still a lot of work to do. Um, so in 2014, uh, this guy named Jake actually released double espresso to solve some of the distribution uh, problems. So you could actually just you know, do a one-liner in your build.gradle file uh, to pull it in. And that was fun. Uh, and at the end of 2014, we kind of deprecated the double espresso project by releasing espresso as part of the Android open source project and part of the support library. Uh, that, was, that was also a fun kind of time. That was right before Christmas, December 19th. And I just remember you know, getting everything ready for the release and you know, just uh, sending a message to Xav, who was still at that time releasing all of the binaries for so the support library. And Xav was like, no, I'm, I'm going on vacation tomorrow, so I'm not going you know, to release this. Uh, and then I, you know, I just sat there and you know, really bummed. And I just waited for five minutes. And then he's like, do you, do you have testing? I'm like, yeah, here's all the testing. Is there, you know, has everything, like, do you, have, you know, did you get all the permissions and everything in place? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, where is it located? And, and he just did it. So that was awesome. That was a great Christmas gift uh, to me and hopefully the community. So 2015, uh, work on Espresso continued. Uh, and this was uh, also the year when we kind of introduced the Android testing support library. Uh, and we also released Espresso Intense. Um, and, uh, our JUnit 4 rules, you know, like a breakthrough in testing technology. Before that, does anybody remember the activity instrumentation test case 2.java? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so thankfully that's deprecated now. We also had our first ever uh, presentation uh, on UI testing and, at Google I.O. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't possess the technology to record talks at that time, so you can't go back and see it. They also gave us the smallest possible um, room that, you know, it was like a box talk. So uh, you could kind of see the pattern here, actually. You know, people are standing in the back here, and it was the same at Google I.O., except there was like a lot less room and a lot more people on the, on the outside of the box talk. But it was still awesome. You know, I think this is around the time when Android finally started to come around to the idea that testing is important, and developers actually care about testing somewhat. Um, at that time, also, we introduced this awesome logo for the Android testing support library. I think it was kind of a missed opportunity, so I modified it a little bit. Um, but some of you, you know, if you're like less optimistic than I am, may say that this should be the logo. I, I think it's it's okay as the you know this one. All right, 2016. Uh, this was a fun year. Uh, I actually, at that time, I, I had to leave Google to go um, and live in France for a little bit. Um, and I was planning to come back, but then I, you know, something happened, and I just decided I'm going to go check out uh, how life outside of Google is. So I joined a company called Slack, uh, and that's where I work today with Kevin and Kine and some of these other wonderful folks. Um, and um, my first project at Slack was to introduce UI testing. So imagine that there, was, there were no UI tests as part of the, the sort of the Slack Android project. Um, and this was a really fun project for me and also kind of scary because I had been developing Espresso. I had been giving talks about how you should use Espresso for UI testing. And I've helped some teams you know, onboard Espresso at Google, but I had never really like, written Espresso tests for a real project myself. It was, uh, <laughs> I know. And so I, was, you know, I sat down and I, I just I thought, OK, I hope this works. And I wrote. It makes you wonder why we hired them, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, I know, I shouldn't be saying this. Um, and uh, 
so I wrote a, a test for our settings activity, uh, and I tried to kind of use all the best practices that I, you know, that I had seen at Google and, and other places. Um, I used actually Chuki's blog post to like, you know, figure out some of the dagger stuff. Uh, so that was really helpful. And, uh, and you know, I wrote this test, I documented it, and I sent it out to the team. And then, you know, an amazing turn of events, the team actually went and took this test and wrote a bunch of other UI tests based on it. So that was, that was cool, it actually worked. Um, oh, actually, sorry. Okay, I'm like rambling, but uh, I'm like shocked by my own slides. 2016, uh, Google I.O., this was also a breakthrough year because Espresso was actually mentioned in the Google I.O. keynote. Uh, does anybody remember that? Uh, it was like the Espresso test recorder. Does anybody use the Espresso test recorder? So like four or five people, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's cool in theory, recording tests, but I, yeah, I think that that's not quite what developers are looking for. Um, I think there's a lot bigger challenges to solve before we get to the recording part. Uh, but it's there, it's like still part of Android Studio and it's, it's really cool. Um, and I, you know, based on my experience at Slack, uh, I decided, okay, I can present this now. I, can, I know this stuff actually works and I, I can present this approach. So I went to Prague uh, and I presented on, uh, on Android kind of UI testing. Uh, this was just my favorite slide from the talk. It had no nothing to do with this topic. Uh, but actually, it, it does demonstrate the fact that a lot of times we, we have an inverted UI test or testing pyramid where we write a lot of UI tests and not a lot of unit tests. Um, the other way around, right? We write a lot of unit tests. A lot of unit tests, yes. No, 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 no. Uh, no, it's actually, no. I, I meant to say that we write a lot of UI tests okay. because it's kind of like the least path of resistance. If you don't structure your app correctly, you end up like having to test everything through the UI, which is it's not something you should be doing. But anyway, uh, so this, if you want to look up the talk, I, uh, so it's called something like Practical Guide to UI Test Development. Um, and the approach that I kind of called it was targeted and hermetic. Uh, and the idea here is very simple, that even though we're doing UI testing, we still can follow all the best practices of testing. And we can just have a test that's focused on just one screen um, and we can set up all of our state and we own, you know, the entire kind of set of like objects that we set up for testing and nothing surprises us during the test. So we don't have to write any conditional logic. So uh, this target and hermetic approach, uh, something I presented on uh, and it's been working out pretty well for us. It's like um, 2017, just a quick mention, again, Espresso was actually um, well, testing was, uh, was a Google I.O. They, they actually had a big room, I believe, or a big like auditorium, I don't know, at like that venue where they have Google I.O., uh, what, it, what that's called. Uh, but kind of Espresso just keeps evolving um, and getting better and better, so things are happening there. Uh, but I'm gonna take it back to Slack, because um, that's where I work. Um, so the reason why we're here to talk to you today is because actually when I conducted the same poll that I mentioned in the beginning of this talk uh, on whether our developers write UI tests or not, it seems like everybody at least everybody who is willing to admit um, does write UI tests at Slack. So like every new screen that goes into the app uh, does have a UI test associated with it. Um, and because of that, we've been able uh, to get quite a lot of UI tests up and running on every, you know, this is like a pre prior to every merge to master. We have like 555 uh, functional UI tests. We should stop writing tests because that's a kind of a cool number. Um, and on the right side, you'll see um, this is our CEO dressed as a poop emoji. Uh, so, and he's giving thumbs up to the fact that we're, we're good at test testing at Slack. Um, does anybody else's CEO wear poop emoji costume? No, all right. Um, no, Stuart is really cool. Uh, we, as you can see, we actually have quite a balanced testing pyramid. So we have some end-to-end -end tests and we have a lot of unit tests. Uh, we rely heavily on unit test coverage uh, for testing. So, at that point, you know, like what else, what else can we do? How can we get better than this? You know, why are, why are we even here? Why, you know, why, why did we not stop with our 2016 approach? Well, here's the problem. Um, as, I, as I said, I love surveys. So I sent out this quarterly survey to all of our Android developers. Um, and uh, we kind of structure it around four areas um, that developers care about, workflow, um, essentially how good are we at keeping developers in the flow, ease of testing, app quality, and release process. 
Uh, and when we conducted the survey for the first time, it turns out that even though every developer, it's, every Android developer at Slack does write UI tests, um, the, the ease of testing didn't score very high, 2.5 out of 4. So it turns out developers didn't really like it that much. Here's a quote, um, you know, that writing quality UI tests is still a difficult thing to do, uh, and it would be great uh, to have some time to put into building up a base to work from. So that's why we're here, you know, still today. And uh, I just want to kind of mention uh, a side note that there have been some efforts uh, previously presented on making UI testing kind of easier and better. Uh, and uh, Jake gave this uh, talk on testing robots, I believe also in 2016. Uh, and here the idea about testing robots, how many of you heard, have heard about testing robots? Cool. Um, so um, some of you may kind of recognize this picture. Um, and essentially uh, the idea of testing robots is that just like with the MVP pattern, you separate kind of the how from the what uh, with a presenter and view and model. Uh, in your UI test architecture, you can also separate the how uh, you interact with the view from the what, like what does the user actually want to do with that screen uh, via a robot. Um, and uh, I think that's, this is a great pattern. So I think you, know, you should use it. I think it does help, especially if you have a lot of tests that share the same screens, if they kind of span multiple screens. And it does make your uh, tests a lot more readable and just kind of more pleasant to look at. Um, uh, and it also does reduce code duplication. Uh, but I think that this pattern does not solve the problem of how difficult it is to do hermetic, you know, kind of functional UI testing. And the reason is that it doesn't take care of this side uh, of, of the picture. How do you actually set up your state uh, prior to launching your screen uh, in a way that's, that's like easy? Uh, because what we gathered by, while you know, sitting down with some of our Android developers is that if you're going to write a UI test, especially for a screen that is kind of like a legacy screen that uh, you know, you're not very familiar with and may not use the best new patterns, um, you're, you know, you're doing this. Like you're blocking off three days of work, and then you're going down this adventure where you're trying to figure out how to set up all your state just to launch one simple screen. Uh, and so as part of um, our uh, test hackathon that we conduct every quarter, uh, we call it Test Week, something that I highly recommend doing for any company out there, uh, we decided that we're going to tackle this problem and we're going to, you know, to solve it. Uh, and it just so happens, by pure chance, the person who actually did most of the work for that is here today. Um, and Kevin is going to tell you uh, how we solved this problem. Okay. Thank you, Valera. So as uh, Valera already mentioned, he, he joined Slack to kind of like improve our test infrastructure and like kind of advocate for us to like improve our testing across, I guess, feature development and everything. But me on the actual feature team, like the core messaging team, I have to actually like put all those principles into practice. And then like giving this kind of feedback in these surveys, we kind of said, okay, it's still not easy to write a test. So um, do you want to be like Bilbo and go on this UI adventure where you're trying to test something, like probably the piece of code that you wrote, and then all of a sudden you realize, okay, it's not just testing some business logic or something. I actually need to set up this hermetic state that Valeria mentioned. And even before I can like fire up, say, my test activity, it's like I need some sort of minimal state, hopefully with the test data that, um, like that I'm actually going to test. And just that setup process takes a while. And it's like not that, you know, it's kind of painful for us. So the problem that we kind of want to highlight is that this is what, uh, was shown earlier where you have your robot and we actually use robots in our end-to-end -end tests and they're great in abstracting that complexity. But at the same time, we feel like, okay, your test is actually kind of responsible for this side as well. Like you want to set up whatever minimal state or the test data in your app. Like if we're talking about Slack, you'll probably have like some test users, you'll have some test channels, you have some test messages and you want to verify functionality based off that. And then your test is kind of like, okay, it's not just interacting with the robot anymore. There's actually a bit more to it. But what does this actually look like in practice? Um, for us, we have a lot of components. Um, we'll have stuff like data providers. We'll have like a persistence layer, managers, helpers. Like however you want to break out the complexity in your app and kind of unit test these separately. Uh, if you actually have presenters, something like a model that we're kind of uh, moving towards, that's great. You can actually like 
you know, put test doubles for your presenters or use mocks or whatnot. And that works really well. But for us, we're still kind of in that migration period. Some, some, sometimes our activities, fragments, they kind of interact with these components directly. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff involved. And just to get your app up and running, like these have to have test data for us. And you're, from a test writer standpoint, you're kind of concentrated on, OK, I know what I need to test with a new component I'm adding, but there's all this other stuff that I need to kind of get going. So you go on this little UI adventure that we put it, where you're kind of like signing up for more than you kind of realize. So you're like, OK, I need to test this. But then there's all this other stuff that needs to know about what I'm actually wanting to test. So what does this look like? So we use Mokito. A lot of people probably use Mokito, but you're welcome to use test doubles as well. So you result in a lot of like repetitive mocking in your tests. So for us, just to set up a user, this is kind of just to illustrate some of the code that goes into mocking out a user for us. This is actually just a small subset just to kind of illustrate the problem. But you'll have a lot of these like when then return statements and it's it's great. I mean like it kind of like I guess blocks out encapsulates that logic so that you can say, okay, we're testing what we're testing actually like has you know, this layer, the immediate layer that it interacts with, it's all mocked out, it's not real, that's good. And then the same thing extends to channels. This is actually, again, just a small subset of what we actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And you'll see this a lot in your tests. And for us personally, we kind of try to encapsulate this logic as best as we can in some sort of like a base test. So your UI test will extend this, like a base test will probably like set up this minimal state of we always have like test user A, and then we always have like so many channels. But what we actually found in practice is that sometimes the minimal state is not actually what you want to test. That's just enough to get your app up and running. So what actually happens is like in your setup type methods, a lot of this might spill out to your UI test. So maybe you'll have to add another user. Maybe you have to add like more channels or like other messages that you actually want to interact with for your actual test. So then this kind of gets very repetitive. You'll see it in the base test, you'll see it spill into your UI test, and like as much as we try to like abstract it away, it kind of still spills out to the test writer and their setup method. So this is probably what the setup method would probably look like as just a little small subset where you kind of like, even if you move all this to a base activity, as I mentioned, or base test, sorry, then there's probably still gonna be more added to your actual test before you can actually test what you care about. So there's a lot of boilerplate. We want to minimize that boilerplate as much as possible. But for now, this is what we were doing. We thought it made sense. But as our tests kind of expanded, this kind of became very, very cumbersome for us. So the solution. So we kind of looked at this. And we're like, hmm, let's think about this. The robot pattern seemed to solve things for one side of it, which is great. I mean, like you would kind of wrap these espresso statements in a way that made sense from the test writer's standpoint, like where I can enter something on a screen. I can tap the send button. It's like, it's uh, I guess from the test writer standpoint, even if they don't understand like what's actually happening under the hood, they know what they want to do from a UI test standpoint. Where I get to do something, I, I know I want, I want to verify this, the outcome. But what actually happens under the hood? I don't want to think like there's a there's a view with a certain ID, and then I have to like tap it and check that it's displayed. Like it kind of moves all that problem away from us so that we can just focus on writing the test. So as I kind of highlighted earlier, it kind of looks more like this. But what if we could flip this diagram around and kind of structure it in something that we want to solve with this power pack pattern? So why power pack? Like, why are we calling our solution the power pack plan, uh, pattern? So we're thinking. It plays well with the robot name. It's, it's, it mirrors it pretty well. So you, if you can imagine that you have a robot kind of interacting with your view, what's actually powering that view on the other side? So naming is hard. Naming is hard. Um, what were the other uh, What were the other ideas we had? Uh, we had like a starter pack type starter pattern. pack. We started with uh, it's like a popular meme on Reddit these days. Yeah. Um, Spark. Spark, yeah, something, I don't know, I don't yeah. know something just to jumpstart your app, perhaps, just to get it up yeah. to this minimum hermetic state that you want. And we didn't have a whiskey-fueled session, so I don't know. Like we, <laughs> we could have, I think, benefited, but yeah. So we thought about it. And then looking at the previous diagram, we're thinking it probably looks a little bit more like this, since your test is kind of concerned about both ends of the spectrum, like the setup process and the robot that actually interacts it once that you know state is set up. But there's kind of an imbalance here. It's just like we know that we want to kind of like 
replace the components and or models or presenters with some sort of test double. So what we did was we thought, hmm, there's probably something missing here. And that's kind of where our power pack pattern comes in, where we're like, hey, why don't we replace the other side of the view with something just like the robot and abstract away a lot of the complexity to the test writer. Um, what ends up happening, it looks like this. And you kind of have, hopefully, a very hermetic test, where the test is concerned about both, engine, both ends of the spectrum. But what you're actually testing is the view itself, hence a UI test. Um, seems to be very intuitive, but uh, what we, I don't know. It's like, it seems like it's a very intuitive thing. I think like, yeah. when I'm saying it, it probably doesn't sound like anything special. And, but at the same time, it's like, um, we, I guess we don't really think about it because we think that, OK, your test data is probably going to be like a one-off thing that you, you set up for one test. You can actually probably move it into the actual test itself, and then you're done with it. But as uh, Every problem in computer science can be solved with another layer of abstraction. So <laughs> we just decided, OK, we're going yeah, we're we're to add this, this layer away. of abstraction. Uh, but no, I think it totally makes sense. When I, when I presented on the targeted and hermetic test approach, I can kind of completely hand wave this, uh, you know, the setup of Makito uh, or te your testing doubles, and I thought, well, you know, just kind of take care of itself. And usually, when you think like that, it becomes a mess. So, uh, so we're yeah. just kind of cleaning up this mess. So, what we're kind of building out is an interface or an API that looks something more like this, where you kind of instantiate some sort of a power pack, and then you think about setting like models in your state rather than components. So you're not thinking like, oh, I have a data provider, or I have some sort of manager that has to know about a user. We want to abstract that all away and put it in these kind of pack classes, which again, mirror the robot classes. And then from a test writer standpoint, you think, OK, well, I want to add users to this test. So I could use something like an auto value builder and then build out these models. But then what I'm actually writing in the actual test are just lines where I add a user, I add another user, I add channels. I can add like messages or whatever. So depending on what it is in your state, what it is in your app that you actually have to build out, you want the tester to think very, I guess, intuitively. Like I approach the problem where I want to build out, you know, stuff that makes sense, I guess, from a test. Almost like if you were to do this manually, what would like a manual QA person do? They'd probably like create some test users, create some channels, and I think. For us, at least even as like, developers, it was like, much more intuitive to think of it that way. And the other reason for that is like, as your team grows, especially in our case as well, um, a lot of these components or dependencies in your app, you don't actually work with a day-to-day -day basis. We actually have another team dedicated to some of the, you know, the lower level, um, I guess, components that you kind of deal with. So they'll build out the APIs for us, and they'll probably like, you know, know the inner workings of it. But it's not really you're concerned to like, you know, dive into their class, open it up, and realize, OK, these are the methods I have to mock out. It's expecting to return this. So we want to move that away and then have it so that as a test writer, you just think about the models. So what does this look like underneath the hood? So um, we have this power pack pattern. We have this power pack class that kind of is able to mock out, I guess, our entire app. But then we still break it out to the actual models that they're dealing with. So each of these, for example, like this users one, you'll notice that a lot of the dependencies that we were mocking out earlier is actually kind of encapsulated here in this builder pattern. So you'll get this users pack, but when the test writer actually gets it, they're not thinking about stuff like the persistent store or the user's data provider or anything like that. They're just thinking about, I'm going to add users to these things, and then I'm going to just have them all ready for me. Everything that's in here will know about it, and that's great. Um, what this kind of looks like is your pack method basically just abstracts this complexity away, and it's written in one place. Um, if these ever kind of change, you can easily like you know modify it in one place instead of like an API changing, and then like maybe you have thousands of tests that have these when then return statements, and that just like spills over like you're replacing like thousands of you know just API methods just because the parameters change or something like that. So here, it's kind of like very nice. The tests don't kind of see the effects of this as your API needs to change. And ideally, this is like written by that person who introduced that component. It's done once. Everyone on the team benefits from using it. It's very reusable, and it's very easy to update in one place. Um, so what does it look like for a channel? So channels are kind of like our bread and butter at Slack. There's a lot of stuff in our app that has to know about a channel. And I'm not even going to go through all these, but there's like a lot of little components to help out. And 
when we actually have to set up some of our tests, we have to go through at least mocking out or replacing with test doubles a good portion of these before we can get our app just to fire up and then be able to switch channels and test whatever you need to test. So this is the stuff that we don't want the test writer to even think about or you know, even have to know about. By the way, just to interrupt, very important note. We, if you notice, we've sprinkled a few emoji here. Uh, we, it's like we have something like 50 thinking emoji. <laughs> um, so did these feature you know, in this presentation. And if you'll notice, this burger is correct. So, yeah, uh, we're kind we're, of missing we're very, some like, lettuce and tomato, but the cheese is in the right place. That's important, yeah, right? That is, yeah. So cheese is in the right place. Um, so what does that look like from before? Your setup method basically kind of instantiates this you know, power pack, and then the test writer is free to update or add users or whatever else to set up this hermetic state that they need to actually test with. So it looks a little better. It's a lot easier to read, I would say. It's hopefully a little bit more concise. And you, know, you don't see like, um, these other dependencies coming into here when that's actually not what the test writer is concerned about. So some wins that we saw here. So the pack classes, just like the robots, they'll have this method where it kind of encapsulates all these Makito statements or whatever test doubles you want to put in your test. Uh, test benefit all from updates all in one place. You, you know, the components can change their API as much as they want. They just have to go and update one of these pack classes, and then everybody benefits from it. You don't see like a PR that has like thousands of test classes changed just to like update one small thing. And you know, the, the most important thing is that the test authors get to focus on actually writing a test. They think about like, I want to click this, tap that, and verify this result, and then know that there are like users in this system, this hermetic state that I want to actually test with. And the other added benefit is that we kind of get this fluent API. So you can just do like an add user, add user, add user pack. Um, so the thing that we kind of want to emphasize on this, it's like the robot pattern, it is a pattern. The implementation is really up to you on what makes sense from your app. But um, the key thing is to kind of abstract away that complexity and move it away from the test writer as much as possible and let them focus on actually writing their test. If you're curious about what we use at Slack, we actually use a combination of Dagger, uh, Makito, and AutoValue. We kind of hack AutoValue in a way just to get that fluent API, but um, we're actually big proponents of AutoValue in our code. We try to like wrap any of our data classes in AutoValue just because of all the benefits you get from it. Um, so the developer feedback. Um, Valera kind of highlight that we started with a 2.5 out of four for ease of testing. And a lot of the pain points came from actually setting up this, like what they needed for the test. It's like a lot of boilerplate. It's like, why are we doing this? And then after we did it again, it improved. Like we saw an uptick. It's like, it's not gonna solve everything, like short of actually writing something that writes the test for you. But you know, we're, we're getting better. It's You're so lazy, you know, uh, developers. Like, I know. Oh, it's like, <laughs> Do you guys have this with like a kind of infrastructure team that are kind of like harping on you? Like, why aren't you writing your UI test? You just wrote a brand new feature. And then we're thinking, well, it's like so cumbersome. It's like, so it's kind of on us to, you know, we're on the same team. We're trying to make this better for everybody. So what else does this mean? We got some feedback um, saying that test writing has improved a lot. And they, we kind of spent that test week that we have to try to migrate some of our tests over to this. And it was, it was successful for the most part. I mean, like everybody like felt it was a much cleaner and much much more intuitive way to approach tests in general. And we're still kind of in the process of migrating over all our tests to this. But you know, it's going forward. This is kind of like the pattern that we've used, and it's it's caused a lot less friction, I would say. And you know, it just kind of makes UI testing more enjoyable, or at least as enjoyable as it can be. <laughs> so another bit of feedback that was kind of interesting is that. Um, we, we got some signal that we wanted to like be able to set up a team really quickly. Because if you can imagine, you'll still be adding like a lot of users, a lot of channels, a lot of like messages. Like what if I have like my test team that's always ready to go? And then I can have like multiple tests kind of always verify the same stuff. And that would be that's great. A, that's a cue that we should go faster. <laughs> so got us thinking. You gotta love the thinking. You gotta think really hard about it. And I guess as engineers, we always think that we could do better. So looking for like a little better solution here. So if you kind of remember, we started with this, and then we kind of moved towards something that looks like this. It's much more cleaner, much more concise. But the question is, could we get to something that looks like this? 
one line initialization of your test. Um, here you'll see that it actually references a JSON file, but basically set it and then you know, fire your activity, you're good to go. Um, to us, if you remember Bilbo, this would be kind of like our Arkenstone, like can we get to this stage? Um, but if, yeah, engineers, what do you expect? <laughs> so can we get here? Um, we kind of played with this idea to set up some sort of JSON config that we define, and then what we saw was you'd build out something like a config file here where it kind of parses your JSON file, and then this kind of takes us to where we're hoping to get to because we're still trying to do more. Like We feel like it's good, but could we do better and make our lives even easier testing? So I'll kind of pass it back to Blair here to kind of let you know where we're hoping to go with this story. All right. So um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to 2018. Um, I, I promise not to make any political jokes, but this is my one political joke. But anyway, uh, so 2018, like, I think we're actually really excited to maybe come back to DroidCon uh, and present on something that we've been thinking about but we haven't built yet. Uh, so please don't build it and present it before us. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this JSON config um, got me thinking, like, if, if, you, if you're a little bit familiar with the Slack API, uh, it's a simple REST API that just returns a bunch of JSON objects. And hmm, what does that look like? Well, that looks a lot like our API responses. So uh, this got me thinking that um, you know, we can kind of go a step further and we can automatically charge our power pack. Um, sorry for, for all the, you know, the puns. But, um, and the way we can do that is uh, we have this test suite of end-to-end -end tests that we're actually converting from Calabash to Espresso right now. Uh, and they talk to a real backend. And by the way, I never believed in end-to-end -end testing, but, but actually it does bring value to us. We don't run a pre-merge, but uh, it's, like it's a nightly test suite, and we get some benefit out of it. So what if we uh, took our end-to-end -end test that talked to the real backend, and we recorded the, the network traffic and just saved it off to some kind of data store? Uh, and from there, uh, you could do actually two things. So number one, uh, you can actually replay that data to a test. And I know that some teams actually take this approach for their entire UI test suite. Um, and we use this approach, kind of record and replay API traffic for performance testing, uh, because we want to kind of maintain the app um, in its entirety, except the network layer, um, uh, and not mock out, uh, do like minimal mocking or faking. However, you can also use this API data uh, to generate our power pack automatically. It's kind of like a no-brainer from there. From there. Um, and then we can actually continuously like, have the freshest, you know, most awesome uh, power pack that you can imagine um, to actually fuel our hermetic functional testing. Um, and uh, just an idea. So if we ever get around to it, we'll, we'll be back here uh, next year to, to present it again. Uh, so once again, thanks for, uh, for stopping by on Sunday morning. And, um, yeah.